So consciousness is a really interesting and <clears throat> cutting edge area in psychology. Primarily because for uh, a century or more, psychologists didn't study it. It was in the wheelhouse of philosophers. And it's defined as the awareness of your self, your environment, and in humans, your own mental processes. The only thing I'd add in there is that it's the brain-based awareness because without a brain, without a cerebral cortex, consciousness is um, not gonna happen. Uh, you could argue that dogs have consciousness. They meet most of the definition. They're aware of them, their name, their environment, what's going on around them. We have no way of knowing if they have any awareness of their own mental activities. So it's, this area is deeply rooted in philosophy. Um, and as I mentioned, the limitations in technology, the fact that it wasn't really something psychologists studied, prevented it from really becoming a discipline in this field until the 1940s or 50, and 50s. Examples of changes in consciousness include what happens when a person has Alzheimer's disease. From the early to middle to the late stages, their level of consciousness changes. Early psychologists like Sigmund Freud talked about consciousness. Now, he never actually said it was an iceberg, but it's been likened to an iceberg. And we know that icebergs are rather large, 90% of which is below the surface of the water. Um, so the unconscious would be the area that most of the very difficult interpersonal interper issues lie. Um, and, and they never really see the light of day. The preconscious would be the zone because an iceberg bobs up and down in the water, it would be the, the part of the uh, consciousness that is revealed from time to time. And the conscious mind would be the part of the iceberg that's always above the water. Well, Freud focused primarily on the preconscious and the unconscious. Um, the problem with this theory is, well, besides many problems, but the big, biggest problem is it's not a testable theory. <clears throat> Other uh, Freudian psychologists like Fr uh, Jung, Carl Jung, protege, the heir apparent to Freud, who constructed uh, not only a, a personal unconscious like Freud did, but he focused more on a collective unconscious. It's a vast collective reservoir of human interactions uh, seen in the form of archetypes. And he used dream analysis to get into those. Again, the difficulty with this theory is it's not a testable theory. <clears throat> in the United States, William James in the 1890s uh, looked at consciousness a little bit differently. Remember, he was the functionalist that talked about the neural network. Uh, and he described it as personal and unique. Uh, everyone's experience, even of the same event, is very different. It's ongoing. That is, there aren't breaks in consciousness, just variation and changes in consciousness. It's always changing. <coughs> Think about your own life as an adult and your consciousness as a child. Um, be hard pressed to say that you have the same level of consciousness uh, now that you did 10 years ago. Uh, and sometimes it's inexplicable. It's hard to put into words. But be, we need to talk about more, more modern psychology than old time. And that starts with the discovery of circadian rhythms. The rhythms of activity that, uh, and inactivity that lasts about a day. And they include sleep, which is the, the most studied of the circadian rhythms, alertness. Even your body temperature fluctuates throughout the day. The flora in your colon that help digest food and absorb nutrients, and even hunger. An example of uh, <coughs> uh, what happens when circadian rhythm gets get tampered with is uh, shift changes. Um, and they cause disruptions in sleep. Jet lag is a good example when your internal clock is out of the normal phase. And it's usually worse going from west to east. Um, shift work, of course, is when people work on different shifts, days, afternoons, midnights. And one of the ways around um, having people uh, have impaired function during shift work is to use bright lights. Um, <clears throat> 
So there's a brain mechanism called a suprachiasmatic nucleus. It's right near the hypothalamus that actually responds to the sun patterns during daytime. Uh, it stimulates the pineal gland to release melatonin. And of course, remember that hormone induces sleep. Uh, that's why most people feel slightly sleepy between 8 and 10 o'clock if they typically have a typical um, bedtime. <clears throat> Begs the question though, why do we sleep? And there's two popular theories. One of them is the repair and restoration theory, which says that <clears throat> sleep enables the body to recover from exertions made during the day. Um, so when people are sleep deprived, um, it causes all kinds of problems, including irritability and decreased um, sharpness and immune system functioning. Uh, how much people sleep do people need? Well, it's on an individual level, but for, for most people, it's between uh, seven to nine hours of sleep, on average about eight. Radney Gardner, a, a high school student in the 1960s, <coughs> recorded the longest uh, awake sleep ever, about 11 days. And when he uh, woke, or when he finally did get some sleep, he only slept about 14 and a half hours. Um, <coughs> you might predict, though, that when he, uh, when the sun came up in the morning, even though he was tired and awake at night, his uh, he became more revived because of the suprachiasmatic nucleus. The other theory is the evolutionary or energy conservation theory that says that uh, regular sleep patterns happen because humans need to conserve fuel and prevent being becoming prey. So, uh, so think about sleep as a mini hibernation, much like bears do in the winter, but this is on, a, on an eight hour basis instead of a three month basis. We're less efficient at night, we can't really hunt. Um, so when it gets dark, we, we become tired. There are differences between species, by the way, um, prey species, <clears throat> that have um, very few defenses like horses, sheep, cows, uh, sleep very little, uh, and they feed on low energy foods like hay. Predators, on the other hand, sleep many hours, often get their calories very intensively like cats and bats and armadillos. Uh, humans are somewhere between the two. Um, so herbivores sleep a lot, or a little, uh, Carnivores sleep a lot, and omnivores sleep somewhere in the middle. That is, humans, rabbits, uh, other primates. Um, so it's important to consider the caloric intake of the food as well. There are different types of sleep. <coughs> William Dement in the 1950s uh, differentiated between REM and non-REM sleep. REM stands for rapid eye movement. <coughs> and it's when you're dreaming, your eyes are moving back and forth. It's called paradoxical because in spite of the mind being very active, all the postural muscles are nearly absent from muscle tone. Uh, we dream 85 to 90 percent of the time during REM sleep, whereas only about 50 percent of the time during non-REM sleep. And anecdotally, we have more REM sleep uh, episodes toward morning. That's why people remember the last dream they had when they wake up. And they occur about every 90 minutes. <coughs> um, infants have more REM episodes because they sleep more. Uh, and it can be measured by what's called a polysomnograph, which is an electroencephalogram that also tracks eye movements. Most people do dream, even though some people tend to forget them. And children under five generally don't report dreaming because they really don't know what dreams are. Uh, lastly, dreams occur in real time. So if it seems like you've been dreaming for five minutes, it probably had been. Non-REM sleep is non-rapid eye movement, and it's stages zero, th or stages one through four. Um, stage one is the start of the REM cycle. Stage four is the culmination uh, leading to a REM episode. The importance of REM periods is really not quite known yet, but it seems to be involved in the consolidation of memory. There's some different eye pattern from an electroencephalogram. <clears throat> you can see it, the rest pattern at, at the second from the top. 
uh, when you're relaxed in alpha waves. When you go into theta waves, you become more relaxed, like during a relaxation or a hypnotic trance. And by the time you get to stage four, the you have big delta waves, sleep cycles, followed immediately by a REM episode. Look at the contrast between the two. And this happens four or five times every night. Well, no one really knows why we dream. Freud thought it was a way of dealing with unconscious issues. <clears throat> so dream content had both manifest, that be on the surface, and latent or deeper meaning. Um, again, this is all interpreted through the lens of psychodynamic theory. Um, Jung believed that it was being in connect connection with the collective unconscious. Uh, so basically he believed that everything in the dream was a representation of some archetype or some uh, disconnected human um, experience. There are other theories though. The activation synthesis theory says that basically the lower levels of the brain, including the pons, <clears throat> become active during sleep and act in a way like a sentry. The cerebral cortex take this stimulation and tries to make sense out of it. So if you're listening to your clock radio while you're sleeping or your television, your dream may actually reflect what you're hearing. The neurocognitive theory says that dreaming is really no big deal. It just happens under certain special conditions. One is that your eyes are closed. Your cerebral cortex has less activity, including less control of thinking. So anything's possible during a dream. Um, but the truth of the matter is nobody really knows. <clears throat> there are people that have sleep disorders, including insomnia, which is poor quality sleep, feeling tired the next day. There's narcolepsy, which is seems to be related to epilepsy. It's a, like a sleep attack. Uh, typically, it's triggered by a high emotion like crying or laughing. Sleep apnea is poor sleep because of disrupted breathing. That's what the apnea means. Um, and the problem with it is that there's long-term health consequences to it. Um, there are tr treatment methods like weight loss, exercise, and of course, a CPAP machine. Sleep talking is the most common form of sleep disorder. Uh, it happens during both REM and non-REM sleep. Sleepwalking only happens during REM, non-REM sleep because remember during REM sleep your postural muscles are uh, not working. By the way, the most important thing to do if a person is sleepwalking is to wake them up. Um, just turn the lights on, talk to them. Uh, and this is true not only of sleepwalking, but of nightmares, <clears throat> which are dreams that happen during REM sleep. They're very pleasant, unpleasant and very common. So the best thing to do is turn the lights on and wake the person up and gently get them back to bed, calm them down. Night tears, on the other hand, happen during stage three and four. So they're non-REM episodes. Uh, if you've ever seen a night terror, uh, they're pr they are pretty terrifying. Uh, YouTube has some videos that show people in night terror episodes. Again, turn the lights on and be, just be careful with the person. <clears throat> Restless leg syndrome happens very commonly in elderly people. It's usually fitful movements of the legs. <clears throat> Nobody really knows why it happens, but trying to imagine um, sleeping when your legs are jiggling uh, and so it disrupts sleep. <coughs> there, all of the things we've talked about to this point are involuntary states. That is, they happen whether you want them to happen or not. The next group are voluntary states. So these are things that people do, including hypnosis, <coughs> where a person has increased suggestibility and focus. Uh, they're more alert in spite of being relaxed. Getting into a, a person into a trance is called an induction. Uh, and typically, the therapist uh, gives a post-hypnotic suggestion. Uh, some important hypnotists remember were Charcot and Mesmer. Mesmer thought it was about animal magnetism, so he passed metal objects around the body to disrupt the field. Charcot thought it was um, a technique that was used to de deal with things like hysteria. Uh, more contemporary hypnotists include a real famous American named Milton Erickson. Um, people 
because it's a voluntary stage, people can't get you to do anything you won't want to do. Um, some people experience hallucin hallucinations during hypnosis, but in many cases it's just the therapist being aware of how motivated the client is and their way of thinking or cognitive style. So in a, in a sense, it's very much a special case of psych, uh, cognitive psychology. It's been used in medical, dental, uh, pain con and habit control like smoking, but it's never used in court because um, courts have established that it's too easy to uh, put details into testimony, so it's not admissible in court. There are other ways of creating uh, meditate, uh, hypnotic like states, including meditation, which includes yoga and tai chi, yoga being Indian, tai chi being Chinese. But there's different types of Buddhist meditation, Hindu meditation, Chinese meditation, Christian meditation, Sufi, and even guided meditations that are um, things that more Westerners have come up with. Uh, but anything that you can do that causes parasympathetic arousal is uh, will be effective in producing um, a med meditative-like state, including taking drugs. Uh, any drug that works in the synapse is called a psychoactive substance. So water wouldn't be, but of course marijuana or alcohol would be. Uh, most of the time they affect activity in the nucleus accumbens, which is a midbrain structure that responds to pleasurable things, especially the uh, production of dopamine. So it doesn't have to be just um, alcohol or drugs. It can be anything. It could be gambling, sexual activity, uh, other strong habits. And of course the treatments that are used include abstinence-based treatments like Alcoholics Anonymous or Smart Recovery, which is <coughs> like AA but takes Scott out of the formula and talks more about uh, the scientific nature of recovery. There's a harm reduction model that uh, recognizes the uh, that people relapse from substance and addictive behaviors, so it it tries to reduce the reduce those risks. And of course, the moderation approach that teaches people it's more of a behavioral approach that teaches people how to. Um, drink reasonably, how to control their, habit, their habits instead of stopping them. Drugs can be divided into four groups depending on how they affect the central nervous system. Some increase activity, like amphetamines, cocaine, Ritalin, caffeine, and nicotine, and they primarily affect dopamine. Drugs that decrease activity include alcohol, barbiturates, and benzodiazepines, which are also known as minor tranquilizers. They uh, mimic or uh, increase the levels of GABA in the brain. Remember, that was an inhibitory neurotransmitter. The ones that dull activity include morphine, heroin, and other opiate-based drugs, and they affect endorphins in the brain. And the last group, ones that distort activity include LSD, ecstasy, PCP, and they affect serotonin receptors. Um, marijuana is a special case um, because uh, while it's now legal in Illinois, it's not federally legal, uh, it seems to affect and both some opiate receptors and especially anandamide receptors. The DSM-5, that's the newest version of the diagnostic manual, <clears throat> um, did away with substance abuse and dependence and calls it substance use disorder. So it's seen on a continuum from substance abuse on one end to substance dependence on the other. Substance abuse is defined as using a substance in a way that's unintended. So having a drink of alcohol is different than drinking a case of alcohol. Um, substance dependence, of course, is highlighted by uh, psychological and physical dependence, and especially withdrawal symptoms when the substance is discontinued and tolerance um, with continued use, that is that you need more and more of the substance to get the same impact. 